Hey everybody, Nick here. It's Monday night, and tonight on this prayer and devotional time, we're going to be in John chapter 12, at least that's where we're going to begin. Uh, we'll be talking about the Christ, the Son of Man, and uh, working through some of the things that are there in the text that I think are applicable for us today, uh, just as they were applicable for the people uh, who heard Jesus say them. Uh, and so, since we're going to be talking about the kingdom, ultimately, I think I've selected a, a perfect song for our time together. Uh, let's worship our God. I'll be back in just a moment. Excellent song there for what we're going to be talking about uh, this evening. So our family was in Reno, Nevada, from Thursday until yesterday. Uh, some of you may know I coach uh, wrestling in a club uh, here in town at one of the local high schools. And so I took uh, several of our club members uh, to Reno and uh, coached them uh, while they were there. Uh, no, uh, no hardware brought home, but all of our kids did really well, really proud of the way that they performed out there on the mat. 
Uh, yesterday morning, we got to worship with the First Century Church of Christ in uh, Reno. I uh, got to visit with our brothers and sisters there. And while we were there, you know, I got the Sunday off. So I got to sit under the Word of God. Always something good uh, for me to do. And uh, the brother was talking about this text here. Brother Mark was talking about John 12, beginning here in verse uh, 20. Now, there were some Greeks among those who were going up to worship at the feast. These then came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and began to ask him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip came, told Andrew. Andrew and Philip came and told Jesus. And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour has come for the Son of Man. That's a key phrase in this section. Okay, It's this phrase that's going to prompt a question uh, from the crowds. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. That's also an interesting word. We'll come back to this. Truly I say to you, Unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. He who loves his life loses it. He who hates his life in this world will keep it to life eternal. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. Where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Now, verse 27, Now my soul has become dismayed. I'm using the Legacy Standard Bible which is essentially a, an update to the New American Standard Bible. And like the New American Standard Bible, when you have Old Testament quotations in the New Testament, they will put the text in all caps. And so that's, that's what's going on here. If you see that, if you work with a New American Standard, or if you've stumbled upon the Legacy Standard Bible, Jesus here is quoting from Psalm 6 and verse 3. My soul also is greatly troubled, but you, O Yahweh, how long? So my soul has become dismayed. And what shall I say? Father, save me. And this is what I like about the New American Standard, the Legacy Standard. Um, also, you get this in um, uh, my Greek text will do this. In identifying um, snippets of quotation from the Old Testament. And it just so happens, Jesus has just quoted from Psalm 6 and verse 3, and now this is from verse 4. Turn, O Yahweh, deliver my life. Save me for the sake of your steadfast love. And so, you see here, in all caps, um, this is the immediate context for what Jesus has just quoted from Psalm 6.3. Now he quotes from 6.4. And so, clearly, that psalm being applied by Christ to himself, but he's taking a little twist on it. it. Will I pray what the psalmist prayed? Save me from this hour, Father? But for, and it, it, the way this is worded here anticipates a negative response. No, but for this purpose I came to this hour, Father, glorify your name. That's what his prayer is, glorify your name. And a voice from, uh, came from heaven, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. So the crowd of people who stood by and heard it were saying that it had thundered. Others were saying an angel has spoken to it. This is very interesting. Just briefly, the response you get from a supernatural event then is similar to what you see today. People will, on the one hand, either do anything they can to try and dismiss the supernatural as anything but the supernatural. And in this case, the first response is, well, did you hear thunder? Right? They, they, a voice from heaven, this is the Father then speaking about the Son, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. But the unbelievers in the crowd attributed something supernatural to just merely, merely the natural. And again, you, you find the same thing happening today, right? Uh, when it comes to people, unbelievers, seeking to explain the supernatural by simply natural means. Others were saying... An angel has spoken to him. So here's the other side of this, where you may have spiritual but not religious people who recognize that there's more to this world than meets the eye, and, but, but they will not attribute it to God, the one true and only God. They'll attribute it to something else. In this case, they attribute it to an angel. Okay. Um, 
The more things change, the more they stay the same. Verse 30, Jesus answered and said, This voice has not come for my sake, but for your sake. Now judgment is upon this world, and the ruler of this world will be cast out. That's the devil. Jesus is going to do that through the cross. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. It's interesting that the phrase here, all men, is in the immediate context. Where did this passage begin? Back in verse 20. We had Greeks. And so the idea here is uh, all people from all over the world, Jews and Gentiles. And that's key to what we're going to see here. We're going to make a connection in the Old Testament in just a moment. Um, it, this, this cannot mean um, every single person who's ever lived, because obviously there were people who lived before Christ who were not drawn to him because he wasn't lift, lifted up yet. Um, but rather, this has a specific meaning given the context. And, and given the larger scope of Revelation, um, that uh, this the, the promise of the gospel is not just for Jewish people, but for Jews and Greeks, Gentiles. But he was saying this to indicate the kind of death by which he was about to die. Crucifixion, lifted up. Crowd then answered him, We have heard from the law that the Christ is to remain forever. And this, our brother spent quite a bit of time on this verse here, giving a, a, a very uh, detailed panoramic view of prophetic literature that deals with Jesus. And he started off in Genesis 49 until Shiloh comes, okay? and went all the way through to the book of Daniel, which I thought was uh, very beneficial because our, our Bible doesn't just have 27 books of the New Testament, it has 66 books. And so we need to be people who know our Old Testament. Um, uh, he started off in, in Genesis because of the, the phrase here, the law. However, as this phrase is used in uh, the Gospel of John, it doesn't just mean Genesis through Deuteronomy. Here... And in fact, we, we probably should have gone earlier uh, to uh, John chapter 10 and verse uh, 34, uh, because in that text, let me get back here, because I know I can get to it fairly quickly. John 10 and verse 34, yeah, Jesus answered them, is it not written in your law I said, you are gods. And there, Jesus is quoting, not from the first five books of the Old Testament scriptures, but from Psalm 82. So he clearly, when, when this word, the law, or this phrase, the law, is used in John's gospel, it contains more than just Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. It's good to see Genesis 49. That's... Um, you know, until Shiloh comes and all that, so, you know, remaining forever could certainly be connected to that. But uh, then, uh, here in John 15, verse 25, uh, but the word that is written in their law must be fulfilled. They hated me without a cause. And again, this is a reference from the Psalms. It could either be from Psalm 35, 19, or Psalm 69, verse 4. So, the law, in John's Gospel... And, and in all of, uh, because it's not just in John's Gospel uh, that I looked, but also I searched 1st, 2nd, 3rd John and Revelation, which don't have any references to the law. Uh, but in John's Gospel, and the way he is using this, it encompasses more than just the first five books. And, and that's important, because as we come back here, what is, what is the specific question that people ask? We've heard from the law that the Christ is to remain forever. Now, he's just talked about being lifted up, and that's indicating the manner in which he's going to die. And so, you know, the Jewish people have certain ideas. In Jesus' day, they had certain ideas about what Messiah would be and what he would do. And it's not exactly lining up with what Jesus is describing his mission as. Right? So, the, the Christ is to remain forever. Where would they get that idea? Well, as you continue here, how do you say, and remember this phrase, the Son of Man must be lifted up, who is this Son of Man? And I believe it is this phrase here. First of all, Jesus, he, uses, he used that phrase 
a lot about himself in the gospel. Uh, the Son of Man. Uh, over 80 times that phrase is used to talk about Jesus in the Gospels. So it is a, a favorite phrase to describe Jesus, who he is. But where does the phrase come from? What's the, what's the, the text in back of that? And I believe that the key text is, I come over here, here in Daniel chapter 7. Let me come back here. So there's, there's the question, right? The Christ is to remain forever. The Christ is being equated with the Son of Man in this text, okay? So they, they clearly have an idea that, yeah, the Son of Man and the Christ, that's, that's the same figure, okay? So where does that phrase come from? Well, it's in Daniel chapter 7. As I looked, thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. Who is this? This is God. That's who the Ancient of Days is. His clothing was white as snow, the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames, and its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and came out from before him. A thousand thousands served him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court sat in judgment, and the books were opened. Now, just briefly, a little bit of the context here in Daniel 7. And I, I back in the archives, when we did the Against the Grain series back in 2020, which I just wrapped up here in recent weeks, um, Daniel 7 you can go back and watch the video, uh, do a lot of in-depth there. But it's about the rise of these coming kingdoms. And there's a contrast that's being made between these earthly kingdoms, which are going to rise and fall, rise and fall, and the kingdom of the Son of Man, who is the Christ. And, and so the, the judgment that's being issued here is upon these earthly kingdoms. God has his books, which are used for judgment. I looked then because of the sound and the great words that the horn was speaking. The horn is this uh, political figure who has risen up and is, is bringing devastation upon the people of God. And as I looked, the beast was killed and its body destroyed and given over to be burned with fire. As for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was taken away. Remember, here in Daniel 7, all these different animals, these beasts, uh, are being used figurative, uh, figuratively, metaphorically, to describe these kingdoms that are coming, and their dominion will rise and then go away. That's the idea here. Their dominion is taken away. Their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. Who prolonged it, by the way? They're on God's timetable. That's, that's the key theme, and one of the key themes in Daniel. I saw in the visions of the night. Okay, so the Ancient of Days has taken his seat on the throne. You have the, the divine council, as it were. The heavenly court has sat, and judgment has been rendered. And as Daniel sees all this, behold, with the clouds of heaven. It's a very interesting statement. Because when uh, Jesus has done the will of the Father, perfectly, obedient in all points, even to the point of death on the cross. He's risen from the dead. He is with his disciples for 40 days, and then what happens? He ascends back to the Father's right hand. How? Clouds. And I believe what we're seeing here, what Daniel is seeing in the vision, and what is being communicated in the vision, is that ascension. This one like a son of man, completed the work given to him by the Ancient of Days, that is to say, the Son has been perfectly obedient to the will of the Father, gave him his work to do, and now he is ascending back into the Father's presence, the clouds of heaven. And there came one like a son of man. Um, I believe the other versions, uh, Legacy Standard Bible, New American Standard, say one like the son of man. This is where the phrase Son of Man comes from. I know there's a lot of attention paid to the book of Enoch and all that, but it's right here in Daniel. He's seen prophetically how this one like the Son of Man came to the Ancient of Days. This is the Son ascending back to the Father, and he was presented before him. The Son presents himself before the Father, uh, presents even his blood Right, that he has made atonement on behalf of his people. 
and to him was given dominion. Remember, the, the dominion given to the other kingdoms went away, right? Way of the dodo. But this, we see the origin of the dominion of this Son of Man. And its origin is completely different. It is not earthly, it is heavenly. It is given to him by the Ancient of Days. So the Father gives this dominion to his Son. Glory and a kingdom. Where does he get his kingdom? He receives all authority in heaven on earth from his Father. It's been given to him. He says as much. Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. John chapter 17 also, uh, verse 2, talks about this. That all, notice that. Remember, we, we just saw um, here in uh, John 12, 32, he's going to draw all men to himself. That is, and we know Daniel 7 is in back of John 12, clearly. It's in the minds of the people. It's in the mind of Christ because he's talking about the Son of Man. And here, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. That's the, that's the universal scope of this thing. It is, again, not just for the Jewish people, but for the Gentile people as well. That all people's nations and language should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion. Where did they get this idea that the Christ would remain forever? Right here. They read their Bibles. Daniel 7. It's right here in the context. This Who is this Son of Man? Right, And, and Jesus, you're saying you've got to be lifted up? Well, the reason they missed it, the reason they missed the death, right? And, and indeed, Christ does remain forever, but not like they thought. He would lay down his life in death, which is part of the glorification theme in John's Gospel, by the way, that the cross is viewed as the enthronement, the exaltation of the Son. <coughs> Excuse me, his dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. Indeed, after his resurrection and his ascension, he receives the kingdom and all that. Yeah, it is an eternal kingdom. And he does remain forever, but not in the way that they thought. They thought he would come conquering and to conquer and march on Rome and establish his throne here on earth and all that. And so they, they had a very physical idea of what the kingdom was supposed to be like. Now, I think we need to be careful because... We can swing to the other side of this pendulum. Someone's got a noisy vehicle. I'm not sure if you heard that, but... We can swing this to the other side of the pendulum and just um, spiritualize it entirely, right? Or make it just a personal thing. Um, where it's just Jesus ruling from the throne of my heart. But as we see from elsewhere in Scripture, He's not just Lord of me, He's Lord of all. And that is something that's being communicated here in Daniel 7. His kingdom is one that shall not be destroyed. Uh, couple this with what's said in, say, 1 Corinthians, where, uh, well, and, and also that, 1 Corinthians 15, 25 is what I'm thinking of, he must reign until all his enemies are made a footstool for his feet. But where does, where does Paul get that language but from? Another text, which could be in the minds of the people as well, Psalm 110, which is God's favorite Bible verse, right? Uh, Yahweh said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies a footstool. All of human history is the outworking of Daniel 7. That what is happening in human history is Christ ruling in the midst of his enemies with the Father causing the enemies of Christ to become his footstool. Right? Remember we saw their dominion goes away. Why is that? Because you have this eternal dominion, this everlasting dominion of the Son of Man. And so coming back here, um, what is Jesus' response to the question? For a little while longer, the light is among you. Essentially, he says right here. Earlier in John chapter 8, I'm the light of the world. Okay, Talk about himself. He is the light. While you have, uh, walk while you have the light, so that darkness will not overtake you. He who dwell, walks in darkness does not know where he's going. While you have the light, believe in the light. Faith. So, 
Who is the Son of Man? The light. Right here in front of you. Right? And, and what should they do? That's Jesus. He always goes one step further to bring them along. What should they do? Believe in the light. That you may become sons of light. And, and I'm already making connections here to Ephesians. But I do want to just uh, come over here and remind you of something that we've covered many times before. The Jewish people in Jesus' day, um, in fact, we can go back here to John 12, because it goes on here to talk about um, he'd done many signs. They still were not believing in him. Verse 37, this fulfilled the prophetic word from Isaiah, Lord who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed. For this reason, they could not believe. And again, another quotation. Uh, this, this was Isaiah 52, and this is Isaiah 6. He has blinded their hearts, hardened their hearts. Uh, so they, they could not. They were not able to believe. And so the Jewish people, and, and look, it's, it's very easy to pile on the Jewish people of Jesus' day, but the reality is Paul gives us insight into this, that it's not just a Jewish problem, it's a Gentile problem as well, because it's right here, the heart. Okay, For indeed, Jews seek after signs, and Greeks search for wisdom. We preach Christ crucified. To the Jews, a stumbling block, and to the Gentiles, foolishness. But... Those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, remember all peoples, nations, languages, the all men of John 12, both Jews and Greeks, and from among them, the called, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. And so Christ, he is ruling in the midst of his enemies. He's bringing them to heal. The Father is causing them to become the footstool of his feet. But, to those who are called, to those who do what Jesus says, believe in the light. For us, it's everlasting life. So, just some things there to think about. Connections, old and new, that are vital for us today. We do need to move on to our prayer requests. We have um, several requests that we want to honor at this time. So uh, right where you are, I want you to invite the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit to come to be with you. And as we draw near to God, God draws near to us. Lord God, we thank you for listening when we pray to you. We know that you hear our prayers. We know that you answer our prayers. We pray that you would fill us with faith in Jesus who is the light. That you would help us to put our hope in him and, and to build on, well, the only foundation there is, which is the name of Christ. We pray that when we face troubles, that we'll call upon you and glorify you, even as Christ did. We thank you for always being with us when we call out to you. Knowing these things, Father, we do want to lift up a number of requests to you. We pray for the Crossman family as they continue to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. We pray that you would surround them with your loving, abiding presence. Let them know that you are with them and be of comfort to them at this time. Pray for uh, Thomas Wayne and we uh, pray that you speed him along to full recovery. We give you praise for uh, Stephanie being baptized. Also uh, TJ, uh, wonderful to hear that. And we're grateful that uh, Laura was delivered of a healthy baby boy. There are many on our list here with cancer. We want to lift them up to you by name. We pray for uh, Nancy, John Hatter, Phil, Chris Shook, Jeff House, Lee, Greg Hall, Paul, Joyce, Lynn Brocco, Chris, Robin Wooten, Wendy, Yvonne Wheeler, Margaret Diaz, Cindy Lindsay, Michael Patton, Renee, Daryl Christensen, Cecilia, Susan, Ron Treadway, Dwight McBride, Bruce, 
Bill Hunt and Mason. Father, we pray that where there are doubts, you would grant faith. Where there is despair, you would grant hope. Where there is sorrow, we pray you would grant joy. According to your sovereign power, we pray that you would grant healing as you deem fit. Father, these other uh, requests that are before us, we uh, commit them to you. And where there are health issues, we pray that we call upon you as the God of health to be involved and to grant healing as you see fit. Where wisdom is needed, Father, we pray that you grant Holy Spirit wisdom. Uh, where repentance is needed, we pray that you grant repentance, that people would look to you and make good decisions. Uh, where uh, there is need for guidance, we pray that you guide people in the way that they should go. Um, where there are mental health concerns, we call upon you as the creator of our brains and our bodies uh, to grant peace of heart, peace of mind to those who are struggling with that. Father, it is so good to know that You'll do even more than we ask or imagine. And so we, we pray, Father, that to that end, that you would answer these prayers in a powerful way. We proclaim the mystery of faith that Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on us. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of man, have mercy on us. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of David, have mercy on us. Abba, we belong to you. We are our beloved's. His desire is for us. Glory to the Father, to the Son, to the Holy Spirit, now and forever and to the day of eternity, we pray. Amen. Well, thanks for joining me on this uh, Monday night. Glad you chose to spend just a little bit of time with me this evening, uh, thinking through uh, several texts. Yeah, we're back from Reno, and glad to be back uh, home, back in the swing of things. So, there is that. Be with us Wednesday night for in-person Bible study. Uh, we're continuing our work through the Psalms. We'll be in Psalm 29, uh, 29 uh, Wednesday night. But it will be with you Thursday evening. Yeah, that's going to do it for me. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord cause his face to shine upon you and give you peace. May God richly bless you, my beloved siblings. Until next time, have a good evening. God bless.